the first taraz and the first effulgence, which hath done from the horizon of the mother book, is that man should know his own self and recognize that which leadeth unto loftiness or lowliness, glory or abasement, wealth or poverty. Having attained the stage of fulfillment and reached his maturity, man standeth in need of wealth, and such wealth as he acquireth through crafts or professions is commendable and praiseworthy in the estimation of men of wisdom, and especially in the eyes of servants who dedicate themselves to the education of the world and to the edification of its peoples. They are, in truth, cupbearers of the life-giving water of knowledge and guides onto the ideal way. They direct the peoples of the world to the straight path and acquaint them with that which is conducive to human upliftment and exaltation. The straight path is the one which guideth man to the day spring of perception and to the dawning place of true understanding and leadeth him to that which will redound to glory, honor, and greatness. Baha'u'llah. Thank you so much. This week, we are so excited to have Mr. Russell Ballou on his topic of the prosperity imperative, getting wealth right. Mr. Russell Ballou has been a certified financial planning professional for several years. He helps his clients achieve a dynamic coherence between their transcendent spiritual aspirations and the practical imperatives of maintaining their desired lifestyles for a lifetime. He uses his MBA in investment management and over 15 years of experience to help his clients retire with dignity and ascend with grace. Russell accompanies his wife, Tarane Tashatkar Balu, in service to their three children, Yasmin, Ervnan, and Bayan, in their community building activities in Northern California. And with that, I'll hand it off to Mr. Russell Balu. Thank you so much for being here today. You know, um, the passage that was shared just now talked about how wealth was necessary especially for those who dedicate their lives to educating humanity. Uh, today, this address is dedicated to the memory of Mr. Marcelo Palmieri. Uh, he's a Baha'i that recently passed away in our kingdom, and he was a teacher and greatly loved by his students and greatly loved by his community. Let's put up the slides. So today we are going to attempt to advance our understanding of how to weave a dynamic coherence between the pressing material requirements of life in this world and the next. We will attempt this using the illuminating insights of the word of God. You see, we're all Baha'is and Baha'is believe that Baha'u'llah's revelation is the word of God for this day. As we struggle to apprehend the gems of divine wisdom and his utterances. And one of them, for example, is regard man as a mind rich in gems of inestimable value. As we struggle to understand these passages, we gain insights and also the energy to help humanity bring about the golden age of universal prosperity. We believe that the power to really make this happen is derived from every soul's attempt to struggle, to understand and implement the teachings of God for this day. Another passage from the Baha'i writings is, the call of civilization, of the progress of material world, this pertaineth to the world of phenomena, promoteth the principles of material achievement, and it is the trainer for the physical accomplishments that we all wonder and enjoy. It comprises the laws, regulations, arts and sciences through which the world of humanity hath developed. Laws and regulations which are the outcome of lofty ideals. These noble notions emerge from each soul's struggle to read and apprehend and then come into accord with the will of God. There was a very famous social scientist named Will Durant who did an analytical survey of every major civilization throughout history. And what he was able to discover is that each one of these civilizations began with the coming of a manifestation of God. 
whose teachings trained souls and inspired the rise of extraordinary civilizations. His exhaustive analysis of the vectors that foster the rise and precipitate the decline of civilization led him to say, and this is his quote, civilizations begin with religion and stoicism. They end with skepticism and unbelief and the undisciplined pursuit of individual pleasure. That's an interesting passage. I think what it affirms is what all Baha'is believe. His study of the social science helped to corroborate what we as Baha'is believe, and that is whenever the messenger of God comes, he gives us the power to remake the world. So today we will attempt to perceive uh, an inspired approach to the challenge of being spirits. We are all just spirits preparing for an eternal existence while also having to meet the practical requirements of life in this material world. That's what we'll try to do today. You know, many years ago, there was a king whose love for gold knew no bounds. Midas was the king of a country in Asia Minor called Phygara. And he had everything a king could ever want. He lived in luxury, he had a castle, and he shared all of this with his daughter. Even though he was very rich, Midas thought that his greatest happiness was provided by being with and playing with his gold. He was so smitten by the substance that he would go into the dungeon where he kept it and <laughs> even bathe in his gold. It was too much. Anyway, one day, the Greek god Dionysus came to visit his kingdom, and he brought a satyr. And this uh, satyr got drunk and fell asleep in the king's garden. Midas discovered him and said, hey, I think you need some help. So he was very gracious, he was hospitable to the satyr, and this made Dionysus happy. So Dionysus came down from Mount Olympus and said to the king, I'll give you anything you want. Midas thought for a moment, he said, well, the only thing I want is gold. Can you make it so that everything I touch turns to gold? Dionysus says, really? Are you sure? That's probably not wise. It's certainly a little immature. The king said, no, that's what I want. Give me what I want. So, snapped his fingers, and Midas had the power to turn anything he touched to gold. He was overjoyed. He ran from his palace, touching everything he could find, out into the garden, touching the trees, the grass. Everything became golden. His daughter happened to be passing by and ran towards her father for her customary embrace. And of course, she turned to gold. This caused the great king pause. He had what he had asked for, but the blessing had become a curse because of his immature greed. He wailed turned to Mount Olympus and begged Dionysus to remove him from this curse. Dionysus smiled, looked at him and says, it looks like perhaps you have attained a measure of maturity and wisdom. Snapped his fingers and Midas was released from the curse. I share this story to start our conversation today to say that we have to realize that wealth and all of its wonder is not something that we should only aspire towards. In fact, there's so many more wonderful things that we should love. In the Bible, we read the passage where it says, the love of money, right, is the cause of all evil. The Baha'i writings encourage us to turn our hearts to God, to our fellow human beings, and make that the animating force. Today, we are going to talk about becoming wealthy, because one of the other things that the writings say is that once a human being has learned to love his Lord and to love humanity, as we heard in the passage read at the beginning of this, wealth is not only okay and good, the Baha'i writings say wealth is necessary. So we're gonna discuss how does one become prosperous and it, in the, some practical things about investments something that many are perhaps thinking about given what's happened with the markets recently, okay? 
I'll read this passage. The great being saith, regard man as a mind rich in gems of inestimable value. Education can alone cause it to reveal its treasures and enable mankind to benefit therefrom. Again, remembering our dear Marcelo and his wonderful work he did so assiduously to educate people. Okay, let's continue. And this is the passage we read at the beginning. Having attained the stage of fulfillment and reached his maturity, man standeth in need of wealth. And such wealth as he acquireth through crafts or professions is commendable and praiseworthy in the estimation of men of wisdom, especially in the eyes of servants who dedicate themselves to the education of the world and the edification of its peoples. So let's get into it. The first step in the process is that Baha'u'llah teaches individuals have a twofold obligation to fulfill in response to God's promise, promise to send us guidance and to give us confirmations. In fact, we can read directly from his most holy book, the following passage. The first duty prescribed by God for his servants is the recognition of him who is the dayspring of his revelation. The second is to obey, right? To observe every ordinance, continuing from the passage, to observe every ordinance of him was the desire of the world. These twin duties are inseparable. Neither is acceptable without the other. Now, you say, well, what in the world might this have to do with wealth? <laughs> it's everything. You see, wealth begins with our faith in process, right? Our faith in God our faith in humanity, our faith in process, and it ends with the systematic acquisition of virtue. In fact, one day when he was asked, what is the Baha'i faith? Abdul Baha says, to be a Baha'i is to love humanity and to serve it and to systematically strive to, cul to cultivate virtue in your life. I always ask people this question, what is the world's most precious possession? In the eyes of God, the most precious thing in the world is the spirit of faith. We read from the Bible, truly, truly, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Again, from the Bible, Matthew, it says, whoever, and this is speaking of faith, whoever has will be given more, and they will have abundance. Whoever does not have, even that they have will be taken from them. Faith and obedience to God's laws are the foundation that allow us to have the energy and enjoy the confirmations that bring about wealth. Now, the Baha'i writings say wealth is necessary, but we must love God first and humanity. Man is the supreme talisman. Lack of a proper education hath, however, deprived him of that which he doth inherently possess. We go back to the story of King Midas. He needed to go through some adversity to learn that wealth is useful, but it's secondary. This tree is a wonderful metaphor. And as we look at it, we see a couple of dynamics. I think the most powerful one for me is the reminder it prompts of the fact that we have a dynamic coherence between the things of the world. You can see the tree there, for example, having to drive its roots into the dirt of the earth. As human beings, we have to strive to make a living to provide services, it's not easy, but we must remain oriented towards ideals, transcendent notions, noble inclinations, very much like the tree. You see, the tree derives its inspiration, light from the sun. And if it does not turn to the sun and receive that light, it dies. You see, that light facilitates a process we know in science called photosynthesis, by which it generates the energy to thrive. In human beings, we derive our light from turning to God and attempting to follow his guidelines. This gives us the energy to bring into this world wonderful things. One may ask, well, Russell, if faith is so terribly important, how do you get it? What's the process? Let's consider what Baha'u'llah says in this beautiful passage. He says, striving, effort is required only when the lamp of search 
of earnest striving, of longing desire, of passionate devotion, of fervent love and rapture, an ecstasy is kindled within the seeker's heart, and the breeze of God's loving kindness is wafted upon his soul, will the darkness of error be dispelled. I want to pause for a moment and think about what that passage just said. Faith is something that we have to work towards. But once we do that, we are blessed with God's loving kindness. He helps us. And in the hour of his assistance, reading the passage, at that hour, the mystic herald, bearing the joyful tidings of the Spirit, will shine forth from the city of God resplendent as the morn, and through the trumpet past of knowledge will awaken the heart. It's a beautiful thing. I mean, just imagine, we make efforts, God sends his Holy Spirit, it inspires us, and we gain new knowledge. Then will the manifold favors and outpouring grace of the Holy and everlasting Spirit confer such new life upon that seeker that he will find himself endowed with a new eye, a new ear, a new heart, and a new mind. We become replenished, a new creation. In that, and with those powers, we are then able to pursue virtue. Let's look at this gentleman. We all know him. Consider uh, Bill Gates. He was able to conceive, conceive and believe in something that had never existed in the entirety of the human race, and that is the Windows operating system and all of the office productivity things we take for granted and use today. I mean, just think, countless times you as an individual, you've used these tools. And you're not the only one. All over the world, people have used these tools. This is a beautiful passage pertaining to people that make lives of their fellow human beings better. It says, and the honor and distinction of the individual consist in this, that he, among all the world's multitudes, should become a source of social good. Is any larger bounty conceivable than this, that an individual looking within himself should find that by the confirming grace of God, he has become the cause of peace and well-being, and happiness and advantage to his fellow man. Certainly, there's no denying that all of us, even Mr. Gates, have faults. But oh my goodness, what a blessing that God recognizes and allows us to celebrate our services. In this case, he won for himself lots and lots of money, <laughs> right? You know, the Baha'i writings say, anyone who rises up to cultivate their virtues in service to humanity, cultivate their virtues in service to humanity, is worshiping God Almighty. What a blessing. Virtues are lucrative in this world and the next. Each of us is created with potential to bring our unique endowments to bear for the benefit of the human race. Faith gives us the capacity to imagine new products, novel processes and services with which we can take humanity to the next level. And of course, for doing this, we receive income. The foundation, of course, again, is virtue. Let's explore this in a little detail. One of the first virtues that you have to experience, and I think Vita, who will attest to this as a high school student, is the concept of deferred gratification. When you're in high school and you're investing in the process of becoming educated. You don't get paid for that. You often have to go through a lot of work. It's not easy, <laughs> right? Faith and the power we get from the Holy Spirit to persevere allows us to become invested with capabilities, right? But without that capacity to work hard, you never experience the emergence of those virtues with which you can go out and get cash flows, right? I often work with youth, and one of the things I tell them is, you know, if you had to choose between coal, a lump of coal, and one diamond, which would you pick? All of them say, of course, I'll pick the diamond. I'll say, well, do you realize that the essential element in coal, called carbon, is exactly the same element in a diamond? No, I didn't know that, Mr. Bully. Yeah, it is. It's exactly the same. The difference is that the fossil fuel, which is noxious and not necessarily worth very much, when pressed and put under the pressure of heat, very much like going through high school and college, where you have to do exams, 
you have difficulties and challenges, those pressures transform carbon from a noxious fossil fuel into a glittering gem. This is the process. Let's talk about this process in the life of a particular individual. I want to celebrate Ariane Miller. Ariane is pictured here. You'll see if you're the, the, on the very bottom picture, the woman smiling with the big smile there. And again here uh, in the middle picture, the woman on the right. And you, I can't pick her out with all of us here uh, on Martin Luther King Day. But what you're seeing Ariane do in the middle picture is she's studying something called reflections on the life of the spirit. She is in the process of emerging her spiritual insights, her capacity to discern the truth of things, her capacity to put spiritual things first and primary, right? That's what you do in book one. And in the picture on the bottom, she took a group, she's an animator, a junior youth spiritual empowerment program animator. And what she's done is she's taken a bunch of young people up to Chico where they made sandwiches to help the people working on the largest fire to ever de devastate the state of California. Well, at the time when Ariane became an animator, she did not have a job. So she said, hey, you know what I'd like to do? That book we use called Breezes of Confirmation, which teaches a person to think about what it is that they want to serve humanity with. Well, that book, I wanna use it to help a group of welfare mothers. I've recently been employed by them state to counsel them. So she took the book, she helped them to understand the process of confirmation. And then she said, you know, I think what I'd like to do is to go into real estate. She took the test, she struggled, but she was able to start her own real estate venture. Now she is a loan officer and a real estate agent. And you can see her picture here above the sign with her beautiful face offering her services to humanity. This is what we talk about when we say process, right? And striving. We give to God, we give to, to our communities out of our love, we become capable, and then we go out and offer our services to the world. And for that, we get money. It's a cool thing. Once we receive money, we invest it. And this is a very important thing. You see, put simply, one may ask, well, why would I want to invest? Well, we invest in the hopes of making money. And to be analytical and thoughtful about it, let's explore for a second, what is money? Well, in one sense, money is a store of value, right? You work really hard, you get your paycheck, and that money comes into your bank account, you keep it there so that you can pay your groceries. It's a place where you keep it so that you know you have what you need to pay for your life's necessities. It's also a unit of account. We use it to determine what our net worth will be, what we may owe the government. It helps us to keep track of our progress. Money is also a means of payment. We no longer, if we are a farmer, we don't give eggs for clothing. We use money to barter, so barter is no longer necessary. I will say that from a Baha'i perspective, and as the financial planner, money is also a means whereby we make our dreams come true, right? All of these things are associated with investments. Let's go back and tie the concept of investing with what we've been speaking about, the spiritual dynamics. See, many of us have heard, because we live in a Judeo-Christian country primarily, this passage. Many are called, but few are chosen, right? Thinking of this passage, we may say, hey, you know what? The people that are chosen, they're fortunate or they're special, right? We think of being chosen as an outcome of luck. However, when we really reflect closely in the passage, we realize that being selected is more about striving, a result of striving to keep faith and obey than a random outcome of luck or grace, right? Let's look at the passage from the Bible. We read this. It's Jesus spoke to them in parables. The kingdom of heaven is like a king who prepared a wedding banquet for his son. He sent his servants to call those who had invited to the banquet, but they refused to come. They paid no attention. Some even seized the king's servants. 
king was enraged. He said to his servants, the wedding banquet is ready, but those I invited were not worthy. Go therefore to the crossroads and invite to the banquet as many as you can find. So the servants went out into the streets and gathered everyone they could find, both good and evil, and the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came to see the guests, he spotted a man who was not dressed in wedding clothes. Friend, the king asked, how did you get in here without wedding clothes? The man was speechless. Then the king told his servants, tie him, hand and foot, and throw him out into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. This is the entirety of the verse. Now, as we think about this, we realize that God is always calling his servants to see him, to follow his laws, and make themselves better. But it's hard, right? It's hard to keep faith. This idea of not only finding God, but obeying his concepts that we find in this passage. You see, the man was kicked out for not wearing wedding clothes. That's a parable or a metaphor for obeying the guidance that we get from God. The foundation of investing, as we've said before, is faith and following the guidelines. We should remember that the word investment, right? Invest means putting on clothing. Let's talk about investments from a more technical financial perspective. Today is May 21st. Many that have invested or are watching the stock market are struggling to make sense of a very volatile investment environment. In order to appreciate what is currently happening, let's recall a myth, a very famous myth about someone we've all heard of before called Hercules. Hercules was given several challenges that he was able to overcome using his brawn, his muscles, and his fighting skills. They saw this and they said, well, let's give him a challenge that he'll never be able to accomplish. It was the challenge of cleaning something called the Augean stables. See, king, the king of Augea had more livestock, horses, cattle, etc., than any other king. He had thousands of each of these types of animals. And he had never cleaned his stables for 30 years. So they knew that the work was so large and big that no one person could ever clean the stables in a month. So they said, well, since it's Hercules, let's challenge him to clean it in one day. Now, Hercules looked at this and surprised them all because he turned to the challenge and he thought. He used his intellectual capacity and said, well, the only way this is going to get done is if I reroute the rivers Alpheus and Pinius. And this is precisely what he did. He rerouted the rivers, flushing the stables clean, and all of the water and the feces went into a field. Now here's where this story bears upon our circumstance. With a question, let, let's prompt this. What do you get on a field filled with all the water you could ever need, plus a lot of fertilizer? Well, you get a circumstance where anything and everything grows. Friends, this is what we've had in this country. You see, for the past 14 years, since ever since the Great Recession, the Great Financial Crisis, we have had in this country a lot of stimulus. On one hand, we've had something called monetary stimulus. That is where the Fed has artificially suppressed interest rates. And they've done something else called quantitative easing. That's on the monetary side. On the fiscal side, the U.S. government has spent trillions, with a T, trillions of dollars on infrastructure and stimulus projects. In fact, they even went so far as to send to you, and you know this because you received it, stimulus checks. Well, that's very much like having a field full of fertilizer and water. And this is what we've had in America. Now, in that environment, all manner of things make, you can invest in anything, basically, and make money. There were things like Dogecoin and meme stocks. These things, wild asset bubbles, all came about as a result of the fact that we had way too much stimulus and liquidity in the system. Now, what's happening is that the Fed is pivoting away from all of the stimulus. It's unnecessary, I would argue, and perhaps I'm wrong, but many experts agree that this is a necessary transition 
no matter how painful it is. We call it in our business price discovery. Basically, that's a fancy word for everything coming back down to normal and adjusting. So what do you do? Let's get more insights. If you're looking at the chart here, you will see that the stock market moves in cycles with periods of contraction followed by periods of expansion. There have been 10 market downturns in the last 49 years. The regions shaded in yellow highlight a contraction phase of a stock market cycle. And the green regions show an expansion phase. One thing we can see by just looking at the chart is that there are a lot more green expansion phases than contractions. Contractions typically are associated with adjustments like the one that I am describing, where, and as a result of this hardship, many interesting innovations occur. That's actually just a fact. So as difficult as this period is, we have to realize, take it in perspective, it's a part of the process of living in a capitalist society. More details. Here you see the same idea. And what you'll see here is that there have been many US equity market downturns over time with varying levels of severity and differing lengths of recovery. The most severe downturn marked the start of the Great Depression when stocks lost over 80% of their value. In this case, the recovery period was over 12 years. More recently, stocks lost 44% of their value during the early 2000s, right? This recovery period lasted for four years, was the second longest in history. Stocks lost 50% during the recent Great Recession from 2007 to 2009. This downturn lasted for 16 months, and the stock market re recovered after 37 months. It is important to understand, again, that these are part of the process. The recovery period may be painfully long. However, it does end. Returns and principal in Stocks, of course, we have to remember is never guaranteed. And as a point of fact, uh, for your reference, these data were all sourced from Ibbitt and Morningstar. Okay, so I don't want to uh, belabor this. I think what I really want to think about with you is, okay, so what do you do when we see the world kind of go upside down and, oh my goodness, my account is down. When times are tough, you need to revisit your plan and your risk tolerance. This is really terribly important because the reason that most of us invest, right, is to prepare ourselves to meet life's big challenges. We invest when we are young so that we can meet our greatest challenge. The greatest challenge for most people is retirement. Imagine it, living for up to 30 years, let's say you retire when you're 65, and many people are living well into their 90s. Let's say you live until you're 95, that's 30 years you have to find a way to meet and maintain your lifestyle during that time. You need to, or I would heartily suggest that you consider, okay, we've seen the markets adjust. How has this affected the probability of me being able to retire in the way that I planned? The numbers that you see here and the chart are part of something that professional advisors use to help their clients gauge the probability of being able to meet their life's challenges and liabilities, retirement, college education planning, whatever it is. At a time like this, it's a good time to call your advisor and say, hey, are we still on track? Now, another question that a person may say is, well, Russell, look, <laughs> I get it that one should stay invested in the market. And I also get it that I have to look at my investments within the context of how they are or not helping me reach my financial plan. But are there better ways to invest when things are challenging? I argue that at times like this, when we are going through price discovery, another fancy word for saying the price fluctuates so much, it may be best to not rely upon price appreciation. If you take out a piece of paper and really wanna follow along, uh, take out a pen and a piece of paper, I wanna illustrate a concept. When you invest, and you put your money to work, there are only two ways by which you might realize a gain from that money. I'll pause for a second and allow you to write out what you think those two ways are. Seconds over. The two ways are if you buy something 
and the price of the thing you bought goes up in price. This is the way most people think about investing. I'm going to buy something and the price is going to go up. But when you are going through periods of market adjustments like this, prices all over the place. As recently as Friday, the stock market started up and it went down a lot. And it ended, and the S&P 500 index ended ever so slightly up. That's challenging. So what I tell people, if you take your pen and piece of paper and write out a little, a very simple, and it's the only math I'll have to challenge you with today, it's a simple equation. If you write down P for price multiplied by Q for quantity, and then say that is equal to V for value, you get to see something interesting. And the interesting thing is that the P or price, we can't do anything about but perhaps there may be something that we can do about the Q, the quantity. And that thing that you may do about the Q is consider investing in something, the second way of investing, and that is something that pays you income. Two ways that your investments might make you money is the price may go up or the thing you buy may pay you some income. We're going to talk about one of the two types of income. The first is, of course, interest, and we get that from bonds, and the other is dividends. Dividends from stocks. Why might a person consider investing in dividend paying stocks? Well, the current market, I think, is very challenging. We have low interest rates still. If you put your money in the bank, you're probably not going to earn a lot. If you put your money in bonds, again, you're probably not going to be satisfied. But there are several dividend paying stocks, equities that you could consider and get a healthy return. Now, of course, in this particular forum, I'm not advocating or soliciting any particular investment or even my services. This is educational. And what I'd encourage you to do is to consider, oh, really? Okay, so you're saying that in this equation of price times quantity, the quantity might go up, but how would it go up from dividends? Very simple, reinvestment. You take the income, that the dividends generate and buy more shares, particularly at a time like this, when the price of some of the things that you're attempting to reinvest in may be down, it may be a great way to make some money. This chart is very simple. It shows you the difference between stocks that pay dividends, and that's the higher number, versus stocks that don't. It's certainly something that you may want to consider now. Again, here you see the amount of money in terms of income, yield, that you're getting from various investments. You know, friends, when you look at your portfolio, many people just look at, oh, whether you made a aggregate gain or loss. One of the things I coach folks to consider is what is the yield? What is the amount of income on a percentage basis that your portfolio is generating? This is something that you may want to give more focus to now, as this is something that you can actually have an impact on. Can't control price, but we may be able to go out and find some excellent income generating stocks. Okay, and again, uh, in this chart, it's really quite useful. You will see the components of total return. In purple, we see price, and it's one of the more dominant elements of return. But you'll see in periods of market stress, like this here during the Great Recession, income becomes a larger component of total return. Just underscoring in a chart my point that, hey, this is a time when one may want to pivot their focus from just P to quantity and driving quantity by looking for investments that pay really good income, good, sustainable dividend income. Now, uh, word of caution. In this environment where things are topsy-turvy, you may say, okay, I want to focus on that, Russell. Are there any potential pitfalls to this strategy? Yes. You have to make careful research and analysis that the company that's paying the dividend has the capacity to do so in an adverse environment like this. What do you mean by adverse environment? Well, there are really two things. One of them is that we have inflation. And in an inflationary environment, 
the companies that have pricing power, and that's something that you should probably write on your piece of paper, the companies that have pricing power, that is the ability to pass inflation on successfully to customers, are going to probably have a higher probability of meeting their future dividend payments. That's number one. The second one is that we are also facing higher interest rates. So in an environment where we have not only inflation, but rising interest rates, you're going to have to ask yourself, does this company also have the ability to make money in a more expensive, that is, higher interest rate environment? These are two things to consider as you're looking at options. All right. This brings us to the conclusion of my remarks. And I'll close with reiterating what I've said to you. Faith helps us. It helps us to find the truth, to find love, not only for God, but for humanity. And also it helps us to pursue best practices and stick with them, particularly during challenging times like this. You see, if we have faith in process, we realize, oh, all of this drama in the markets is actually temporary. I need to be thoughtful. I need to revisit my plan and make sure that I have a high probability of still executing it. And if not, maybe I need to make adjustments like considering incorporating more income into my portfolio. Baha'u'llah tells us that the world is transitioning from its tumultuous adolescence to its collective maturity. As Baha'is, we believe that in all things, even in adversity, there are gems of wisdom. The world is rolling up the old way of doing things. For example, for many years, we've been taught great polar opposite ideas about money. Some have said money is bad, <laughs> right? Or money is everything and do whatever you can to get it. These false dichotomies are reflections of our adolescence. As we move into maturity, we realize that the love of God and attempting to do good in this world requires means. In fact, Baha'u'llah says, all things have been conditioned upon means. So going back to what we've said many times, wealth is actually necessary when a person's mature, because you have to have the resources to bring about all the noble notions that the world now needs. This is something that we are all attempting to learn about and implement. And I thank you very much for considering one person's ideas. I hope that it's just the beginning of your exploration of these important concepts. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for your talk. That was very interesting and insightful to hear about that. Thank you so much. Now we will begin our Q&A portion. If you have any questions, please write them in the chat and I'll read them aloud in the order received. We have one question so far. Could you please comment on why the Baha'i faith promotes the elimination of only extremes of wealth and not more? You know, one of the principles of the Baha'i faith is that we would like to see less extremes. Abdul Baha, when he was visiting this country, actually spoke to this challenge. You know, at that time, the extreme difference between the middle class and lower class, it was even larger than it is now, right? And Abdul Baha observing this said, hey, you know what? These extremes tend to breed resentment. Let's go back to the Great Recession. Many of you perhaps have forgotten this, but at that time, things were so bad that we had spontaneous riots all over the country with people talking about the 99%. People were outraged over the adversity of an economy that did not find them jobs. So of course, the people that were wealthy all bought into the concept of the government bailing people out, right? Because they wanted to help ameliorate these extremes. It's very simple. When extremes of wealth and poverty get too big and too many people have too little, you have political and social instability. The Baha'i faith is attempting to bring about global prosperity so that we can all emerge our best versions, not only for ourselves, but for the world, right? I mean, think about it. If you have a human being that has the capacity to be a Leonardo da Vinci, and that capacity is not unfurled because they can't get an education, or they're too poor to get enough food to think, that's sad. 
not only have we deprived that soul and its family with the possibilities, but we've deprived ourselves of that wonderful contribution that the soul might have made to our lives. I will give you a, another thought. You know, because of the press of time, I didn't even get into the instruments that we have in our faith for helping to facilitate this equanimity between the rich and the poor. So if you'll allow, I'll talk about that for a moment. You know, as a financial advisor, I have the privilege of working with some very well-off Baha'is. And one of the things that all of them do, and this is another stepping stone to consider, you know, the first step is when you begin to make cash flows, of course, you take some money aside to put away to manage your own personal liabilities, right? For retirement and college money, whatever your needs are. But then after that, you say, okay, I have more left. What should I do with it? Well, one of the first things I writing say is that you should give to the Baha'i funds. Because right now, all over the world, Baha'is are engaged in fostering capacity building, right? Like we talked about with Ariane and the work she did with the Junior Youth Spiritual Empowerment Program, helping young people to understand the power of deferred gratification, the power of persevering when things are hard as they become educated. Baha'is are doing this work all over the world. And wealthy Baha'is understand that they, by giving to the Baha'i Fund, we help facilitate the means to make this work go forward. Now, when you have truly become well off, you get the privilege to participate in something called the right of God. This is one of the most extraordinary laws. You see, what it says is that you can sanctify the things you own, right? That is, by giving God his rightful portion, whatever remains is actually yours. Now, that's a lower level understanding. Of course, we shouldn't do things just to make our stuff purified and sanctified, we should give out of our love and joy, right? But that is an extraordinarily useful concept, giving something to God, which is properly his, and then keeping what is actually properly yours. This is a very justifying concept. Well, then the money that is taken and given to God, that money is used for social and economic development all over the world. This helps people that don't have capacity or capital to step out and shine. It's beautiful. Thank you so much. Our next question is, should one consider the social value of the cooperation corporations one is investing in, not just the dividends they pay? I'm so happy that question was asked. So yesterday, a young man named Eric called on me and he said, Russell, I noticed that you use something called Riskalyze. It's a sophisticated software that helps me help my clients understand and quantify the level of risk that they're taking in their portfolios. He says, Russ, I know you're using that, but I have something better. It has a social component. It allows you to take the values and the ideals that your clients have and to invest on that basis. Now I share this story because one, that's a tremendous help. Humanity as it matures is saying, well, I don't want you to just make me money. I want you to make the world better with my money, right? And so he's given me a tool to do this. And this brings me to a concept that I was reflecting on last night. Investing is not only good for you, and if you stick with the process and avoid market timing, things tend to work out better for you. But if you think about investing in what you're actually doing, you're putting money into the world so that Eric's and others like him can come up with new, innovative ways to do things that we've done before. We invest Typically, the people that have the money are older, right? So we invest at a time when our capabilities are, they just weren't, are not what they were before. I'm in my 50s, and I'll have to admit, I can't do what I did when I was in my 20s. That's just how the world works. But I do have more means, more resources than I had when I was younger. Well, through the process of investment, we create a beneficial and a dynamic coherence between the old and the young. The people that have resources, typically the older, invest. And by making your investments, you provide to the world the means for people like Ariane and Eric to have their opportunity to cultivate not only money, but their virtues. Because in the early days of your career, well, let's be honest, you're not quite as reliable and excellent as you are after having done it for many years. That's another beautiful reason for investing. Thank you for that question. 
Thank you. Our next question reads, isn't everything a zero sum game in the system, except for the wealthy who profit while others never really can? Oh, I would, uh, I'm struggling to see the accuracy of that notion. Okay. Uh, zero sum game. So let's go back to what I just said. If I take some of my money and I purchase a pro rata interest, because when you invest, the question you should ask, and this is something to write on your piece of paper, what is the difference between investing and gambling? Well, we all know how they are similar. When you gamble or when you invest, you risk the loss of your capital, right? That's a fact. But when you invest, you are purchasing a pro rata interest in a company, right? There's a whole mechanism for protecting that interest. And that company is a place where, again, people have a practical place to discover and emerge their virtues. So, for example, I worked at a big corporation when I was younger, and that corporation was doing some amazing things in terms of community development in Africa. Well, that corporation also happened to be in the oil business, right? And I think that the story that I'm sharing with you is, well, I got out of it, and that's probably better for the world, but oil is one of those things, unfortunately, that the world is still needing. And it's not just the case that they did oil, they also did other interesting things. So I don't necessarily see investing as a zero-sum game where the corporations make everything. The corporations basically are nothing more than collections of people trying to provide a product or a service to the world, right? And by making themselves public, we get to participate in that. And as the world emerges its maturity, advances its ideals and understanding, even oil companies like the one that I was working at change. In fact, a very large oil company that many of you know recently had two environmentalists elected to its board of directors. They are determined to remake that company from the inside out. Our next question reads, many issues in this country seem to be from or exacerbated by our consumer-based materialistic economy. What would an alternative, better, more spiritual, environmentally friendly, equity-based economic model look like? So I think that the issue is what I've been attempting to address throughout this from the story of King Midas. The issue is the human heart, right? We can rail against corporations, we can rail against politicians, but at the end of the day, if we look at the model provided by Abdul Baha, when he was in this country, he didn't rail against anyone. What he did is he loved everyone and strove to gently lift the veils that covered their eyes, right? And by lifting the veils and allowing people to see more, they can be better and be more, right? This is what we are called upon to be as Baha'is. In fact, I'll take you to a conversation that Abdul Baha had with the maker of the, I don't know if you're understanding the Maxim gun. You may better know something called the Gatling gun. It's a machine gun, right? And this man was wrapped up in the concept of war as being a wonderful thing. Abdul Baha in his very gentle way said, hey, why don't we try peace for a while? If we, can, if we don't like peace, we can always go back to war. Very gently, lovingly helping this man see more. The other thing Abdul Baha said to him, and this blew my mind, he said, look, the creations that you made, and this was a man who made all kinds of things to destroy and hurt people, they reflect extraordinary ingenuity. That's not what I would have ever have imagined a person from God saying to a man who had made machine guns. He said, they re reflect extraordinary ingenuity. Now you may take this ingenuity and apply it to the process of bringing peace into the world. If you do this, this will be tremendous. Look at the example that Abdul Ha gives, uh, focusing always on the positive, focusing always on the virtue and helping the individual to see how to take that virtue, and make the world better. Thank you. Our next question asks, you talked about financial investments, but are there other ways and things to invest in? So many other ways and things to invest in. You know, I chose finance for two things. It's something I know a little bit about. And when you look at, so there's a thing called a pension. Most companies don't have pensions anymore, but I started my career working for the pension of a large oil company. And when you look at what pensions and endowments like Harvard's endowments, 
the thing that most of them put the majority of their money in is going to be stocks. And the reason why is that stocks are liquid, they're easily accessible, and they have historically proven very effective. But that's not the only form of investing, right? You can do real estate. There's so many other things. And in working with my clients, we look at all possibilities. Thank you. Our next question is, if one is saving for future children's education and college, is it wise to invest it in this environment, which is very unstable? And what we read from the writings, humanity is going to go through a major challenge. You know, I'll take the latter part of the question first. From the day Baha'u'llah arrived, humanity has been going through one major process. And that's the process of, in his words, rolling up the old world order, rolling up the old world order, and replacing it with an entirely new system. Let's think about this closely. In 1863, when Baha'u'llah proclaimed himself to be the manifestation of God for this day, in this country, one of the things that had to be rolled up was slavery. How extraordinary, how miraculous that this institution, this long-standing, deeply rooted institution was rolled up right around the same time that Baha'u'llah appeared. But we shouldn't be surprised by this because you see Baha'u'llah said, slavery is now over. Is the first manifestation of God to outlaw slavery. Okay, my point in this is that in order for this to happen, we had to go through a violent, the most violent transformation this country has ever experienced. You know what? During that time, people invested and they did very well. Throughout this time, the entire time that we've had Baha'u'llah, the world has had cataclysms, difficulties, wars. And with each of these events, one side loses. Typically, it's the side associated with notions that are noxious. As recently as World War II, for example, the epicenter, right? What's, what prompted World War II was racism. It was, it's very simple. Hitler said that we are the master race. Everyone else should be our subjects. Well, that's diametrically opposed to Baha'u'llah's teaching of the oneness of humanity. And sometimes human beings are so attached to noxious notions that they cling to it violently. Well, we had that, and immediately after World War II, the stock market did, that was one of the best periods of the market, the 50s, right? Yeah, we will always have these adjustments, but we go through them, and historically, what we've seen is that we emerge on the other side, not only better, but better off. Thank you. Our next question asks, if one chooses to focus only on investment in organizations that are contributing to the well-being of society and decreasing the carbon footprint, is it still possible to earn income? Yes, yes. Uh, I go back to the story with Eric. He says, you know, Russell, I'm going to give you a, a, a platform that allows you to put in the values component. And there are so many companies now, right, that generate income. Dividends, I think is what she may be saying. But you have to have revenue first, right? That's the first step. And then, of course, profits or income. And then from those profits, some companies take it and a portion of that and they distribute it as dividends. Are there companies that are good, clean companies doing that? Yes, there are. Our next question asks, what about investing in real money, gold and silver? Real money, gold and silver. That's a loaded uh, phrase. Uh, so, so let's explore it. The currency that we have in the United States is what's called fiat currency. It has value uh, because the government of the United States says it has value. It's a, it's a fiat, as I just said, and based upon the full faith and credit of the United States government. So uh, one may make the argument that that is not real because there's nothing to back it up. The thing that might back it up is a precious metal like gold. And so what you're asking me is, well, Russell, wouldn't it make sense to just buy gold and, and silver? I, I have no problem with that. Uh, the, the, the difficulty that one has to realize with gold and silver is that historically is not is grossly, grossly underperformed equity investing, right? Um, but I will say that in this environment, and this is and this is only for the period that I'm talking about now, again, May 21st, and I'm not soliciting or advising, I'm just giving some educational thoughts here. Uh, for this period, what's worked best is commodities, all commodities, gold, silver, oil, wheat. The, the crisis in Ukraine is, and Russia, that's really what's facilitating it, 
and inflation. Typically, when you have inflation, commodities do better. Thank you. The next question asks, isn't a society that requires individuals to provide for their own retirement badly organized? Badly organized. You know, it, 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 so in the United States, um, when we think of people retiring, we think of it as a three-pronged stool, right? The first and the most important prong is, of course, the social security system. And the emergence of the social security system did not happen until we had the, the crisis of the Great Depression, which brings me, I want to reiterate and substantiate what I said earlier. Crises, particularly financial crises, force us all to learn and do better. And one of the beautiful things that emerged as a result of that crisis is we can't have our elderly on the streets go hungry. So we have social security. So that's one of the components. Now, one may make the argument, well, social security is not enough. I, you know, that could be agreed to. How can we change that? We have to change people's hearts. <laughs> At the end of the day, everything really, if you want to get to the real solution, boils back to changing people's hearts. Thank you. Our next question asks, is the Hugugula the best investment? So um, I, I don't necessarily think of Hukukala as an investment, right? Because an investment, unless you're thinking of investing the noble notion of your love for God, you know, putting clothing on your love for God by giving up some of your means to him. Yeah, I guess in that sense, it's an investment. I think of Hukukala, you know, I think the, what I think doesn't matter. I think the writings, my understanding, and I could be wrong on this, is that Hukukala is a way to interact and celebrate your love for God. Um, it's conditioned, and this is interesting. The, the center of the covenant is not allowed to solicit for hukukala. You won't have one of the trustees going around saying, hey, please give to it, right? It's something that people do on the condition that they do it joyously, radiantly, right? It's something a soul does as a result of their love. I hope I answered that question. And just for some clarification for some people who may not know, could you explain briefly what Hukukala is? Yeah, it's a beautiful process, right? I call it a process because it begins with the budget. You look at what it is that you need to survive. You look at what it is that you created in the world and your income as a result of what you serve humanity. And as a result of that service, you get income. And then you take from that income what you need to survive. And then there's something left. And the idea is that that part, which is your personal profit, if you will, you take 19% of that and you give it to your Lord. Well, because no one really can tell you what you need to survive, it's a, it's a very personal thing, right? And by pursuing it, you get into the habits of thinking carefully about what you need and what you don't need. Even more importantly, because at the end of the day, huhukala is conditional. That is, while you may write the check and they may cash it and put it towards God's funds, the spiritual benefit is conditioned on God's acceptance. So that forces you to think, oh my goodness, how am I actually earning the money that allows me to contribute to God? Am I doing it correctly? Am I doing it with a spirit of service? Am I, am I doing it out of my love for God and humanity? It's a beautiful thing. It prompts your spiritual and material development. Thank you so much. Our next question asks, how does the Baha'i World Center invest or use surpluses? So that is a question I'm utterly incapable of answering, other than I know for sure that they invest and they follow a process, a well thought through process that I'm quite certain of, but what specific things they're invested in. And, and it does include stocks and bonds and real estate, but that's all I'm allowed to say. Is there a difference between the concepts you are educating us about and, I'm sorry, there's, okay, and the gospel of prosperity? Oh yeah, <laughs> that's a very well thought through question. These are excellent questions. Uh, we have a very sophisticated audience. You know, human beings take what they read from the word of God and they try to use it. We're, and, and, and I'm trying to do that. Every Baha'i is trying to do that. Nothing that I've shared today is anything other than 
a soul's attempt to strive to take what has been written and translate it into reality for, for the human race. One of the things that we see in the world is this concept of the gospel of prosperity. Parts of it are useful, right? The idea that, okay, your destiny is in your hands. That's consistent with the Baha'i teachings. Parts of it are not. Parts of it are materialism, recast and sanctified. One of the great challenges living in the United States or any country in the world now, frankly, is our tendency as human beings to take lofty, noble, sublime things, things that should take us to closer to God. We take these things and we use them as instruments to advance ourselves materially. And so sometimes people can say that they are trying to be pursuing prosperity and they twist passages from the Bible to just advance their own personal interests. That's a test and a difficulty that, frankly, we all sometimes struggle with. I think the difference between what the faith teaches about prosperity and what we may find in other places is that it is an outcome of a dynamic coherence. And that dynamic coherence is the struggle to take what we find in the Word of God and use it to serve humanity. There's a lot of selflessness that we are taught to pursue, not self-aggrandizement. And sometimes with the gospel of prosperity, it's about having the biggest house, the best looking car, baubles, trinkets, and other things that are worthless. Admitting one's powerlessness, can one delegate decisions to others? I think we all do this to a certain extent. Every day we seek the services of another human being. When you go to your doctor's office and say, I'm, you use the word powerless, I would say, I, would, I don't know, I'm ignorant about how my body works in any kind of scientific or rigorous way. God bless you. You've done the hard work of being trained to understand how my body works. So I'd like to delegate or transfer you to you, the authority to help me understand what I should do with my body. Um, so that's the example with the doctor. If we turn to a person to build our home, if we turn to a person to help manage our wealth, all of these are instances where we turn to other people for their services. I think this is how the world at the end of the day was designed to work. We're supposed to rely upon each other. We're supposed to help each other. Thank you. Well, with that, we can finish off today. I'd like to thank you so much for um, speaking with us today. And next week, our speaker will be Ms. Linda Kavalin Popov with her topic on restoring the soul of humanity. And again, these talks occur every Saturday at noon Eastern time. So please invite your friends and family. If you'd like to be on the weekly mailing list for these events, please fill out the contact form that we put in the chat and that we also put in the description box of our YouTube videos. Thank you so much, everybody. Goodbye and have a great week. We'll all see you next Saturday. <laughs>